So hi, everybody. Welcome. It's so good to see you. Um, hi, Steve. So at least the faculty is still with us. Yeah. So what, so here we are for a reading for what we're going to do for Q and a um, after not during readings, but after the readings, if you all would post uh, questions in the Q and a, I will then ask them to the writers. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get through as many as we can for as much time as we have. We'll um, close our screens when we're not talking and we'll mute ourselves so you can be focused on the reader. We're going to start with uh, Misha tonight and then we'll go to Paisley. I'm going to introduce them and then we're going to start reading. Sorry, we're a little bit late. Normally we start right on time. That's you good? good. And then yeah, one I'm, thing, I'm, Sam, I'm, I think what we also want to do is make sure we do another land acknowledgement. Go ahead. Okay, great. So Port Townsend, Port Townsend Writers Conference is located at Centrum, which is located at Fort Warden State Park in Port Townsend, Washington, known to the Skullin people as the village of Katai. And we want to recognize and honor that the Skullin people and the Chimicum people still live here, they still thrive here, and they continue to steward their homelands. And now I'd like to hand it over to Sam Ligon, the artistic director for the Port Townsend Writers Conference. Thanks, Sam. Hi, y'all. I'm going to introduce Misha. Uh, Mikhail Yosel is the Leningrad born author of three books of prose Love Like Water, Love Like Fire, Notes from Cyberground, Trump Land and My Old Soviet Feeling, and his first book, Every Hunter Wants to Know, as well as being co editor of the anthologies America, Russian Writers View, the United States, and Raz Kazi, New Fiction from a New Russia. He teaches at Concordia University in Montreal and is the founding director of the Summary Literary Seminars International Program. Back in the former Soviet Union, he belonged to the organization of Samizdat Writers Club 81 and worked as an electromagnetic engineer and as a security guard at an amusement park. Among his awards are the Guggenheim, NEA, and Stegner Fellowships. His stories and other prose in English and in translation to several languages have appeared in NewYorker.com, Guernica, Agni, North American Review, Three Penny Review, Boulevard, Best American Short Stories, and many other places. He is the greatest living writer of all time. Please welcome Mikhail Yoso. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And um, thank you to everyone who is, uh, uh, who is attending. Uh, I appreciate it. So um, I'll read for um, for 12, 15 minutes. Uh, so from this new book of stories, it consists of 20 pieces. Uh, some are full length stories, some are very short. And there is a novella, which is a, uh, that is very different uh, stylistically and, uh, and tonally from um, the rest of the book. So I'll read uh, three very short pieces or maybe just two. We'll see how I'm doing on time. Um, the night Andropov died. Andropov, uh, uh, many of you may know, uh, was the leader, Soviet leader, that succeeded Brezhnev, and he was a truly sinister and uh, and uh, and generally very dangerous um, um, person, uh, much smarter than Brezhnev, and did his utmost best in the short time that he was at the helm of power in the Soviet Union to push the Soviet Union and the United States much closer to the brink of a nuclear war. So. He left us just in time after 14 months. Um, it was an evening like many others. The dedicated drunks, Lyoka and Dalezhek, two of my fellow security guards at the Kristovsky Island amusement sector of the Leningrad Central Park of Culture and Leisure, were sitting at the large plywood topped table in the main room of the amusement sector's administration cabin, finishing the last of the three bottles of toxic ersatz port purchased with money I had given them earlier in the afternoon at the nearest liquor store, the one on Balshaya Zelenina Street, some two, 10 bus stops away in exchange for their agreeing to take my shift at some unspecified point in foreseeable future. The two could not have looked more dis dissimilar. Lyoka, who was in his thirties, was flaxen haired, flat nosed, pale eyed, void of any hint of muscle tone while allergic pushing 60 presented to the world, a few bold, bold, sharp featured countenance, yet trampling, trampling all the superficial differences between them was the simple uh, hard fact that they both belong to the timeless, ageless, million strong army of eternal Russian alcoholics. 
For the past couple of hours, they had been com complaining bitterly at, to each other about their lives. They, they effectively had none. They effectively had none. No families of their own, no money, no worldly possessions to speak of. Just the acrid smell of their tiny rooms in decrepit, overcrowded communal flats and no realistic expectations of any kind for a better, more dignified future. While they talked, I was reclining with my eyes half closed in a half broken armchair by the window beyond which in the dark, in the meager moonlight covered in snow, loomed the hulking diplodocus of the city's only and the country's oldest roller coaster. It was enormous, ominous, and comforting at the same time. The Russian for roller coaster means American hills. You could always simply kill yourself, Lyoko suggested to Aleshek in a solicitous tone. As long as there is death, there is hope. That's something always to look forward to. Don't lose heart. There is tunnel at the end of the light. Pouring out into two chipped, cheap faience cups the remains of the swill in the bottle, Aleshek shook his head with a heavy sigh. Too fucking late, Lyoko. Too late. I missed my opportunity to kill myself when the time was right, and now it's just too late. Now I'll just have to fucking wait until it fucking happens naturally in due course of my growing decrepitude. There is nothing to be done about it now. Okay, well, here is to merciful death. He raised his cup with his pinky held apart from the rest of his dirty, cursed fingers delicately high society style. To death, Lecho echoed, and they both clinked their cups and drank greedily. You two should go home, I told them, yawning. It's late, and it's my, been my shift for three hours now, and I just want to lock up and go to sleep. They turned their wistful, wet faces towards me. Ah, traitor, traitor, Alejic said with feeling. That's what he and several other fellow security guards there at the amusement sector called me affectionately, traitor to the motherland, or simply traitor, in reference to my having applied unsuccessfully for, for an emigre exit visa from the Soviet Union two and a half years earlier, right after quitting my job as an electromagnetic engineer, and shortly before, in a bid to heighten my uselessness quotient, joining the, the shiftless pool of the shift security guards at the amusement sector. It was a time of bad people in power and the worst time to be a Soviet citizen like me, a Jew, an underground writer. It was essential for me and for people like me to keep as low a profile as possible. And no one's profile could possibly be lower than that of a nighttime security guard at the Central Park of Culture and Leisure, charged with the duty of keeping an eye on the roller coaster. You, you, my dear traitor, you lucky bastard, you will yet see diamonds in the sky and maybe in the end manage indeed to get the hell out of here and go to Paris and Rio de Janeiro and, and uh, New York and oh, who the fuck knows what other wonderful places. And even if not, if push comes to shove, you're still young and it's not too late for you just to up and kill yourself calmly and optimistically. You have your whole death still ahead of you, you bastard. How I fucking envy you, traitor. That's, no tr that's so true, Lecho piped up, mumbling, his head lolling on his chest. Out, allergic Lecho, out, I told them. I'm tired, and the American heals, and I need some privacy. We want to be left alone. Out, out. You can take the empties with you. That'll be enough for a couple of beers come morning. You'll miss the bus. There won't be another one until midnight. When, finally, laughing like, chi like mad children and cursing, tripping and falling all over themselves on their way down the steep flight of stairs and out the front door they had gone, I looked up after them and wandered aimlessly around the cabin for space for a while, not quite certain what to do with myself. I didn't feel like plowing my way with an English language dictionary through the book of contemporary American short stories that had been left behind a couple of weeks earlier by some rare wayward foreigner visitor to the underground literary club to which I belonged. Sometimes during my night shifts, one or two friends would come to the amusement park to keep me company, bearing bottles of wine, and we would while the night away drinking and talking about everything and nothing about the humdrum lives we'd lived thus far and the imaginary ones that we'd hoped still lay ahead for us. This evening, however, the night air was downright frigid and the hour was already too late for visitors. I went back to the main room and with a spare key that I was not supposed to have, I unlocked 
the uh, apartment sector administrator's office. It was pitch dark in there and the stale air smelled thickly of ersatz port. It didn't take long to find what I was looking for in the dark, in the desk cluttered bottom drawer, an old portable VEF spidola, the compact yellow plastic box with black trim and an intensely green cat's eye of a dial, the exact replica of one that I and millions of other Soviet citizens had at home. Back in the main room, I turned the radio on. The air filled instantly with the forest's worth of joyous sounds. Here in this remote, wooded, scarcely populated part of Leningrad, you could actually get a few foreign stations on the radio. The routine beast-like howling of the KGB jamming frequencies, which suppressed the shortwave radio broadcasts in Russian by, quote, enemy voices in larger residential areas along the giant city's irregularly shaped perimeter was muted, depleted of energy and disinterested, and disinterested in itself as though unwilling to carry out its patriotic duties. I had three, quote, enemy voices in Russian to choose from the Voice of America, the BBC and the German wave. Radio Liberty deemed the most perniciously and openly anti-Soviet by the Soviet counter-propaganda counter officials was unintelligible everywhere in Leningrad. They were playing moody jazz on the German wave. The BBC disappointingly offered an in-depth overview of the contemporary London art scene. The Voice of America, however, was a different matter. As soon as I tuned it up, I heard the broadcaster saying in a baritone to melodious and the Russian to correct to belong to someone living in the chaotic midst of it. The official sources in Moscow are unofficially reporting the death of General Secretary Yuri Andropov after a long Yuri Vladimirovich Andropov, the refined bespoke suit wearing, tennis loving, single malt scotch sipping, terrible poetry writing head of the KGB, Brezhnev's successor at the helm of power in the Soviet Union, the butcher of Budapest who crushed the 1956 Hungarian uprising. At that point, as though suddenly realizing that there were dramatic circumstances at hand, the local jamming installation swung into action, commencing to howl and ululate with a doubled fury. I gave the dial a few quick nudges and heard nothing but the same enraged howling everywhere, as though the world had suddenly been taken over by a giant pack of wounded wolves caught in a blizzard. I went back into the administrator's office and returned the spidola to the desk drawer. In the dark, I lifted the receiver of the massive black beetle of a telephone and bringing it to my ear, heard nothing but silence. The line as usual at night was dead. I was alone in this tiny world of mine, holed up in my cabin. As far as the rest of the world was concerned, I did not exist. And anyway, there was no one with whom I could share and discuss the news of Andropov's death, not any of my friends, who likely had gone to bed already, not with my girlfriend who lived clear across town at least 40 minutes and five rubles away by cab and had no phone in her one room apartment. Restless, I returned to the main room, switched off the unshaded yellow light there and stood by the window for some time with my forehead pressed against the frosty window pane, contemplating the roller coasters, hulking snow covered mass placidly mysterious in the pale moonlight. There was nothing for me to think or to feel. Something was happening, something was going to happen. That much I knew. I couldn't wait for the morning to come. I winked at the roller coaster, feeling a protective warmth toward it. You stupid thing, you be well, I said. It just sat there. Andropov a mort, I said aloud in French for some reason. I didn't know any French. My voice sounded hoarse, wild in the night's solitude. If someone, some lost Erzat sport begotten ghost materializing before me at that moment had told me that 30 years later, I would be writing about Andropov's death in English in America on the week when post-Soviet Russia's ruling class made up to a considerable extent of the old KGB cadre would be celebrating the 100th anniversary of his birth with a huge, with a large exhibit dedicated to his life at whose opening a glowing telegram from his spiritual successor, President Vladimir Putin would be read, well, I would have known for certain that I had finally and irrevocably, once and for all, lost my mind. I went along the hall and into the room where the security guards slept while on duty, which of course they were not supposed to do, on the long, narrow, leatherette couch with uneven, cracked skin. 
Taking off my sweater, I rolled it into a semblance of a pillow, lay down on the couch with my head propped on it, and then picked up from the floor by the couch and covered myself with the stinking ancient communal goat skin that my amusement sector colleagues used as a makeshift blanket. I thought that I would have difficulty falling asleep given the state that I was in, but this was not the case. I was out like a light the instant I closed my eyes. So there is that. And um, uh, Sam, are you there? I'm here. Uh, how much more time? Do I have any more time or should I uh, stop right there? You have 3.5 minutes. Okay, well then I'll stop here. awesome Misha I've heard you read in a long time it was really cool and I'm gonna have a question for you about it in a minute after our next reader yeah okay thank you um that was the sound of two hands clapping that's the answer <laughs> to that Cohen um <laughs> our next reader widely regarded as the greatest living writer of all time Paisley Rectal is the author of a book of essays the Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, a hybrid genre photo text memoir, Intimate, and The Broken Country on Trauma, a Crime, and the Continuing Legacy of Vietnam. She's also the author of six books of poetry, including most recently Imaginary Vessels and Nightingale. Uh, her most recent book, Appropriate, a Provocation, examines cultural appropriation. A two-time finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Prize, her work has received the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Fellowship, which, where did you go for that, Paisley? Everywhere. Yeah, that was amazing. That was uh, amazing. I'll, I'm going to ask you about that later. A Guggenheim mm -hmm. Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, Pushcart Prizes, and inclusion in multiple editions of the Best American Poetry Series. Her poems and essays have appeared in or are forthcoming from the New York Times Magazine, American Poetry Review, Poetry, The New Republic, Tin House, and on National Public Radio, among other places. She teaches at the University of Utah and is Utah's Poet Laureate, and is also Utah's favorite poet. All right, everyone <laughs> applaud wildly for Paisley. <laughs> Amy, okay, let me see if I can actually share this screen because this is for some reason not showing up. Um, let me see, what am I gonna share? Can anyone see this? No, no one can see that. Choose what I want to share. Um, window, Safari, share. Does that show up? Of course not. Why is this not showing up? That's so annoying. Okay, let me try something else. Um, let me, Paisley, can you send it to me and I can try to share uh, it? No, it's not going to work so well. Okay. Um, dot org. Let me see if I can do this. I am so sorry. Okay. Let me see if I can do this now. Um, cancel share screen Chrome tab. There we go. This is a new version of this. Okay. This is an interactive. Can all people see this? Can anyone see that? You're sharing a screen. I can't see what you can see. You can totally see it. Yes, okay, so this is it. This is an interactive reading that you're going to see. You're gonna tell me what you want me to read. So I was commissioned to write a poem about um, the Transcontinental Railroad. So what I wanted to do was to think about the impact the Transcontinental Railroad had on the American culture, thinking about the different workers' histories, but all the different ways that the Transcontinental changed America. But I wanted to figure out how to actually Cap encapsulate all of that information. So um, many of you know that the Chinese worked on the railroad. They composed 90% of the Central Pacific's workforce. Um, and of course, while the transcontinental was being built, the Chinese were eagerly recruited to work on the railroad. But after they were kicked out of the country, basically, or they were like, they didn't allow more in, the Chinese Exclusion Act um, took place 13 years after the transcontinental was completed in um 1669 uh, 1869 sorry that would have been really spectacular um so what i did was i took a chinese poem that had been carved into the walls of the angel island immigration station which is the ellis island of the west coast where the chinese 
were detained, sometimes up to 22 months. This poem in Chinese uh, elegizes a detainee who committed suicide while being detained. So I'm going to show you how to play with the poem. Everything I just said is in the about page. So this is the famous photo of um, East and West shaking hands by A.J. Russell. Hokochi and now from here, the site is the Chinese poem and each character opens into a story about the railroad. Um, many videos, documents, things like that. I'll play you the first video and then I'm gonna ask you what you want to know about the transcontinental. So this is the first video. Sorrowful news. Sorrowful news, sings the telegram. And Lincoln's body slides from D.C. to Springfield, his infant son, Willie, boxed beside him. Buffalo, Cleveland, Painesville, Ashtabula, two coffins, 1,700 miles, 14 days on 14 railroads. One day, a great line will unite us, the president promised. Father and son displayed capital after capital, Louisville, New Albany, Baltimore, Chicago. The black trains beach upon a tide of roses. Can you believe still in the promise of this union? I saw, General Dodge wrote, a little Negro drop on his knees and offer prayers. While above, the dark news thrums on wires, gone, 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 gone across poles tall as the ones from which the president ordered 38 Sioux to be hung. Okay, so here comes the interactive part. You tell me what you want to listen to. Do you want to know about prostitution? Do you want to know about Chinese death rituals, environmental destruction, presidential impeachment, cholera, murder, adoption? Would you like to know about um, uh, immigration policies. Would you like to know about, gosh, it just goes on and on, um, archaeological expeditions. Would you like to know about Hollywood? So just put it in the chat and I will, death rituals. Everyone goes right for death rituals. Death rituals, prostitution, and then immigration policies. Here we go. All right, so death rituals. First thing you need to know is that the Chinese would, um, I'll play this in one moment. The one thing you need to know about the Chinese is that many of them did not plan to live in the United States. They planned to go right back. They were considered sojourner workers. So many of them paid a huiguan, uh, which is a sort of death merchant to uh, exhume their bodies if they were to die in the United States, break up their bones and send them back to Tunghua Hospital in Hong Kong so that their bodies could be um, sent back to their families. And this was so commonly known that many actually um, smaller newspapers across the West reported these strange death rituals. So this is some information about that. And I swear to God, it works. <laughs> I don't know why it's not working. Oh, okay. This is one of those things that makes you want to die. Totally makes you want to die. I might have to go. Body. There we go. Oh. 
A carload passed last night, their bones returned in barrels marked pickles. Thick as bees, ants, locusts, celestials lay siege to nature in her strongest citadel. Their genius is imitation. Show them once to do a thing and their education is complete. Wherever you put them, you'll find them good. They can withstand freezing, hunger, thirst, and heat. Their simple, narrow, but not dull minds running in old grooves. Congealed quantities, crystals of social substance. Unicated as boys or sodomites, they breed defunct in the heat of germs. They can be shipped to shore in great quantities. Even their clothes come identical, studded with rivets. And I'll play the next one because this one is drone footage and I'm just really excited about that. Return. If fallen leaves return to roots, what grows when leaves cannot be gathered? What returns if not the body? What remains if not the soul? Who is to say these graves empty of their bones mean only loss, not that these men escape death's hold entirely? They are not home, but they are not here either, or have become so full of here, we need another word than gone. So throw out the cormorant, its leg tied with silken ropes. Let it drag the air for memory over and over as many times as you want. You can't snare what isn't missing. This country claimed their bodies. It never trapped their souls. Prostitution, prostitution. Where is that one? Is this one face? No. Here we go. Hold sorrow. Imagine a farm, a famine. Your mother promised you'll learn tailoring. Imagine your father pocketing $600. Now here's the boat, its black planks wet with fog. Here is the room holding a bed, no mirror, your wash basin. You have one window wired to face the street. He will keep his pants on, his greasy shirt, his shoes. Imagine the quarter pressed after into your palm. Your street will be named for presidents you never heard of. The city's lights like strings of blood in puddles. Imagine if you could, you'd carve your father's name on a knife tip at night. Only the train cries, your door locks from the outside. Immigration. All right, let me see where that one is. That should be this one, I think, yes. Have knowledge. Immigration questionnaire given to Chinese claiming to be former US residents or for Chinese entering the country during the Chinese Exclusion Act. Have you ridden in a streetcar? Can you describe the taste of bread? Where are the Joss houses located in the city? Do Jackson Street and DuPont run in a circle or a line? What is the fruit your mother ate before she bore you? How many letters a year do you receive from your father? Of which material is your ancestral hall now built? How many water buffalo does your uncle own? Do you love him? Do you hate her? What kind of birds sang at your parents' wedding? What are the birth dates for each of your cousins? Did your brother die from starvation, work, or murder? Do you know the price of tea here? Have you ever touched a stranger's face as he slept? Did it snow the year you first wintered in our desert? How much weight is a bucket and a hammer? Which store is opposite your grandmother's? Did you sleep with that man for money? Did you sleep with that man for love? Name the color and number of all your mother's dresses, now your village's rivers. What diseases of the heart do you carry? What country do you see when you think of your children? Does your sister ever write? In which direction does her front door face? How many steps did you take when you finally left her? How far did you walk before you looked back? Okay, I think 
I have time for one more thing. Let me see. Um, I'll just play the end. Um, so there's stuff on African American history, the porters um, that worked on the railroads. There's stuff about the Plains Indian Wars, lots of stuff about Native Americans, lots of stuff about Irish um, workers and things like that. So you can play with the, um, the poem as much as you want, but I'll play the end so you know how it translates. And then I'll play the last two videos. Not ash, not gone, but changed. Not a body erased or born of grief alone, but praise. This country made us grow each another soul, not one for earth or heaven only, but nation, electric, dangerous as a third rail. We, the middle kingdom between white and its opposites, its thousand shades of fissure, our existence would compose into a fantasy of whole. Our bodies built more than a railroad. On my 1919 map, red, black, and yellow veins trace rails lengthwise across the states, the fragile paper splitting at its seams. Like any machine, we translate the magnitude of human force to change. We're history, not silent, not invisible, not a dream, not oil, they told me. The first trains ran on steam. And this is the translation. We cannot count all the dead. This is the sound of a train. Then you must be vate to train my miss. Stay And I'll stop there. So that is it. I'm clapping. This, Crap, this, this is remarkable. Yeah, incredibly cool. Um, I'm going to open up Q and A so people could write questions, which I will then read to the writers. Um, Paisley, before, and as those are coming out, I wonder if you can talk just a little bit more about the project itself, give us a little more background on, on the project, how it came about and what's happening with it now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, this is a poet laureate project um, because the 150th anniversary of the transcontinentals completion happened in 2019. So a year before that, I had been commissioned to write this poem. And it was one of those things where I don't think they expected anything but like a nice little sonnet to sort of, you know, say, wasn't this great? Um, and they didn't know. And this is the thing, like my racial background is pretty, you know, it's not necessarily visible to a lot of people. So um, some, you know, I was like, well, I'll, you know, as somebody who's half Chinese, I will definitely write you a poem about the transcontinental. I have no problems with that. Um, but I really wanted to sort of take it and think about it from the lens of the workers point of view or the lens of um, the people who sort of, you know, really were the most affected by what the railroad was and not just financially. So um, there's, I'm still making videos. I've got all the poems are written. Uh, I'm making nine more videos. They'll be up sometime in the fall, I think. And um, just because it's totally insane, I didn't even read you the second part of the project. There, there's going to be a book that comes along with it. And the book actually splits in half. There's all of the individual poems, but then there's a lyric essay that accompanies it. Each poem has a note that um, is its own mini essay that goes into some of the history of the railroad and also the history of my own family. 
um, because, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act affected a lot of Chinese uh, American families up and down the West Coast, especially. So I talk about that as well. And you can access the videos in the fall. I'll put it in the, in the chat. Anyone can go to this. It's off of my own website and stuff like that. But um, I'll still be adding and things like that. Um, Paisley, I'm going to ask you one more question about it. I, I, I mean, so we're interested in, you know, multimedia. And many of us are interested in cross-genre work. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship um, for you as an artist between what you're doing visually, what you're doing with sound, and I don't just mean language, though I do mean language too. So visual sound, uh, what's happening on the page, but also movement in this work. Yeah, so um, I mean, whenever you're working with a visual kind of medium, you're also trying to think about how it simultaneously reinforces or can sometimes speak against um, in, a, in a useful way what the language itself is doing. And I didn't play you any of the Civil War stuff because there are a lot of Civil War, you know, influences on the transcontinental and soldiers, but there's a nice way in which certain gunshots become the sound actually of making the railroad. Um, and um, I didn't play some of the stuff on African Americans, but some of the ways in which um, the music brings out humor uh, in the in the piece was also really important and interesting to me. Um, you know, I was also thinking about getting access to some of the sites around the transcontinental that you really can't see. So all of this stuff that we took pictures of with the, the graves and things like that, um, as well as the desert landscape, that is what is considered the dead transcontinental. There's a line sort of that just um, goes from Promontory Summit and then around the Great Salt Lake. And it's been sort of cut off by the Lucent cutoff, which goes straight across the Great Salt Lake. So um, those ghost towns that you see are actually transcontinental ghost towns and you can visit them now, but it's hard to do. So I wanted to give people the sense of that expanse because when you're physically out there and imagining what it was like to build that, it's just insane. It's insane to think that people did that physically, hand by hand, by shovel, by, you know, hammer. It's, it's so, when you can see that great sweep via the drone footage, I think it gives you some sense of that enormity. Um, Tamara wants to know about um, sourcing video and still images and uh, technical production support. You know, the things that we don't normally do as artists, as writers, right? Normally we work alone. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time working with um, a couple of different types of, you know, people we would not normally work with. So sound producers to try to get that multi or that that sensory, the multi-sensory effect of different languages sort of cascading in there to sort of talk about that. You know, just getting the just getting the different languages took a really long time to get, you know, native speakers or people who are fluent in the different languages that uh, worked the people who worked on the transcontinental, but then also working with a video producer because I I had created a multimedia project that was for the first um, sort of the you know the the first celebration, but um, taking those videos and then sort of bumping them up by talking to this woman who does um, documentary filmmaking, and she's like, you know, it would be great to get something that doesn't just look like historical footage because you know that's what I all I had. And then my own, you know, sort of stills, which were grainy and not too terrific. And so she's like, we can we can add these things in and stuff like that. So it was, you know, I would come up with a draft visually and I'd send it to her and then she'd send me a draft back and then we would sort of talk about it. And there were definitely times where she interpreted a poem in a way that I was like, no, we can't do that. Or she wasn't aware of some of the racial politics around some of the images. We had a real long discussion. She wanted to put in a lynching photo. And I was like, we are not putting in a lynching photo um, on this, you know, on this site. And so we were going back and forth and what are the limits of documentation, you know, and what, when does documentation become wounding versus, you know, you know, illuminating. And so there were a lot of really interesting conversations, but I also have to admit, this was something that was multiple grants in the making. Like this was not money that, you know, was just handed to me. So I had to, I had to, you know, if you're going to do this kind of work, you're probably going to have to become very familiar with grant writing. So have fun with that. I want to shift gears. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got it. Okay. Thank you, Paisley. That was very cool. I can't wait to see more of it. And, and um, I think it's awesome. Uh, Misha, I want to ask you a question. First of all, I love your the death affirmation in this work. It's a death affirming novella. Is it, I want to be clear. That's a novella, correct? No, it's a 
20 short, uh, short and long pieces and, and a novella is one of them. So what, we were, what we were hearing was from short pieces? Yeah, it's a short piece. Okay, but, but, they, but it felt completely stitched together, no? Well, yeah, it's linked stories. They are united basically by the tone of voice, by, with the exception of the novella, by the personality, by his story. It's essentially just memory of the Soviet Union. That's what it is, and we, uh, all together. And one narrator? Yeah, one narrator, yeah. Okay. Could you talk a little bit, uh, I mean, Paisley was doing this too. Can you talk a little bit about time and place in this work? Because we're, we're hearing this as, uh, you know, English speaking Americans, in, in, you know, far away from the place and the time where this is occurring in the Soviet Union. Can you talk about your experience as a writer and how you, how time and place played a role for you or how you accessed it or how it, you know, made it work? Well, you know, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at my craft talk, uh, but uh, um, but it's, but basically, I'm just mining memory and um, going through looking for hot points of memory, and um, uh, um, you know, uh, one the novella, for instance, uh, sprang from uh, uh, an old photograph that I found uh, in among my mother's uh, uh, possessions, a photograph of. Um, my grandparents as young people in Belarus and, uh, and, uh, and, and reimagining of one night in their life or rather five minutes of their lives, uh, of her life, grandmother's life in uh, uh, 1939. So here you won't be able to see what's on in the photograph, but it's a photograph of my young grandparents and their parent and their mother. And it's all in Belarus where she took grandfather to keep him from inevitably being arrested and executed because that was the Stalinist purges and he was a member of the party and a prominent up and coming member of the party and so forth. So um, um, all of those pieces essentially, I don't know, nobody, nobody put this mission on me and I don't view it as a mission, but it's basically, um, you know, I was lucky uh, having lived the full life back in the Soviet Union to pass through this linguistic membrane and be able to write about this in English, it probably one of very few people or maybe alone in my generation. And so I thought that, uh, you know, if I can do that, I should just write about that world that is no more, the country that is no more, the city that has been renamed. Um, so that's essentially a work of memory, but it's not nonfiction necessarily because imagination in this case is, uh, because memory in this case is imagination pointing backwards. Um, so that's, that's how I remember, that's not necessarily how it was, that's, that's how, just how I remember it. Um, and there is, there is a difference there, in my opinion. Um, so, so that's, uh, so these stories cover significant territory, but indeed uh, the stories, short stories are peppered with death, because that's what uh, I remember. Paisley? Uh, so in addition to, to Andropov's death, there is also a whole day covering Brezhnev's death, for instance. Yeah. Did did okay. So do you? I was wondering. Do you write in in Russian and as well as English when you're working on your short stories? You write immediately in English. How does that work? Oh, immediately in English. I don't translate. I wouldn't be able to. The languages oh. don't mesh. They don't. Uh, they're not compatible. And uh, um, and and in a way, I, I write in Russian too, but mainly nonfiction for some publications. And it's kind of a reward for writing in English. Because because I'm not bilingual, um, uh, uh, I'm not nowhere near being bilingual, so it's a struggle, but it's an enjoyable struggle because it's always the process of overcoming. But I start writing in English because uh, you know uh, Russian offered absolutely no resistance to um, any emotions that I felt, and uh, my first years in America were filled with a. Um, uh, kind of understandable uh, sadness and depression and uh, think, thoughts that I had made the greatest mistake of my life, but there was no going back. And so Russian was just too, all too willing to offer me to wallow in misery and self-pity. It was, it was free air and Russian is very good for uh, enabling one's wallowing in misery and self-pity because it's just that kind of language. And, and, uh, and I sort of like decided to put up this certain wall between myself and my past in the form of a foreign language. And I started like working at that. 
And that's how that process was. Sam, as a matter of fact, was saw me in the very beginning of that process, some 32 years ago at the University of New Hampshire in the graduate writing program. So and I so, thought you and I would have said that you were bilingual. Well, but I'm not. What, uh, what would make you bilingual? Uh, um, uh, I read like three, four times faster in Russian than in English, for instance. And, and, and the fact that I, uh, that I do uh, actually helps me with my teaching because I read slowly and that means I have to, of necessity, read closely. And so sometimes I notice things that I might not have in, in student writings that I might have zoomed just over if I were just reading in Russian. I say I said that that struggle is kind of good for me. Uh, uh, my example is whatever it is, but uh, but but the real genius, like like Nabokov, for instance, uh, many Russians would take an issue with that, and certainly. But I certainly believe that English kept him in check. He he his his talent was too abundant for Russian language. Russian just enabled him to be like a John Ashbery. You know, you just start somewhere and then five sentences five pages later you're like in a whirlwind of dust how did i end up here so so i think that he simply is better in english even though he his whole life bemoaned the loss of his uh free-flowing and trembled uh russian language as he put it what so, about you are you better in english or russian well it's it's different i think i'm better in english quite frankly because uh, uh um it it cups it it um uh, it limits the number of choices again i'm no beckett but when he at 46 years of age when beckett switched to writing in french he gave a like a fairly expensive uh reasoning for that but uh he, he boiled down it simply to, i i know too many words in english said beckett so it's a know. restriction yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean, I really thought the piece, what I, what I liked about the piece too, is, and what I meant by death affirming was I thought it was incredibly funny, you know, so I loved how funny it was with all that, that weight on it. And then we get the lines, like, as long as there's death, there's hope in the line that followed that something about um, there's a tunnel at the end of the light and all that play on those cliches was just really funny to me. And it made it even funnier that you were reading it into a silent box. That we weren't hearing any laughter. I mean, it just made it really weird and, and kind of cool. What you couldn't hear is my cat meowing in background because <laughs> he freaks out when I speak off into space with like, and not to him. So <laughs> it was awesome. Hey, a couple people want to make sure they know the title of that book, Misha. Um, it's a uh, love. It's my. It, it came out last month. Love like water. Love like fire. Love like water. Love like fire. Which is the title of the novella in the book? And, Which and that's also in, in the program. You'll see that in uh, Misha's bio, that title. Yeah. All right, that was awesome. Those, those were great first readings. We're out of time. That couldn't have been better, so we're not going to have any more. That, that's all the readings we're going to have for the week. We don't need to do any other ones. There's no way to, to go anywhere else now. Is that cool, George? 